it's a great pleasure to be here and to be able to talk about a subject very close to my heart, education, and in particular, how to be more scientific about it. Now, some of you may have already heard me speak before or watched my confessions of a converted lecturer on YouTube. And um, most of my talks on education, I start them with that picture on the screen and ask the audience, what is it that is happening in that picture that was taken of me when I taught my introductory physics for pre-med students at Harvard? This is a very old picture, it's BC, before computers. You can see I'm using an overhead projector. The point I want to make with that picture is that the traditional approach to teaching focuses on information transfer. And what is important is not what the instructor does in front of the students, but what happens inside the brains of the students. And it turns out that's not very much. And I'm going to back that up with some data that were published recently in an article that was published by my colleagues at MIT in the Media Lab. They developed a very interesting sensor that you can wear around your wrist that measures electrodermal activity, which is a measure for, uh, for brain activity. Actually, most of this paper go, you know, goes to great lengths to point out that the electrodermal activity measured at the wrist is correlated, very strongly correlated, with what happens inside the brain. The great thing is that you can basically wear that sensor for a week, then download the data and analyze how brain activity correlates with different activities during the day. So they had a couple of students wear them for a week, and they published in that paper, without, I think, commenting very much on um, the actual activities, this graph that, you show, that, that I'm showing here, that shows on the vertical seven days, at the bottom day one, day two, day three, day four, and you can see the electrodermal activity, the brain activity, basically, as, as the trace that goes up and down. And labeled in color at the bottom, you can't read it, the letters are too small. Oh, incidentally, on the horizontal axis is time, for a reason that I don't exactly understand. It starts at 16.00. I guess at MIT the day starts at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, I don't know. And then it goes all the way to 3 o'clock in the uh, afternoon. Now, you can't see it, you can't read it from where you are, but I want to draw your attention to the parts of these trays that are labeled lecture. Actually, they're labeled class, but you know, they're typically lectures. The trace goes flat. In fact, it's very interesting to contrast that with the brain activity during sleep, which is highlighted there. In other words, students are more asleep in lectures than they are when they're in bed. You know, the French writer, Albert Camus, once said, some people talk in their sleep. Lecturers talk while other people are sleeping. <laughs> I wish he could have seen this trace because it would have made the point much more salient. Now, there's only one activity. There's only one activity that matches class. You can read the labels, which is good, because I want you to guess in what other activity does the brain go flat? TV, exactly. Here is TV. And of course, that's something that people knew a long time ago because people had done, you know, using electrodes in the brain, scans of brain activity of people watching TV. And it's been known for probably close to 40 years that people are more asleep in front of their TV than they are in bed. If you stop to think about it, it shouldn't be so surprising that class or lecture, including this lecture here, is not that different from watching TV. And I think that's a very important message, especially as we move a lot of information transfer out of the classroom, onto the web, onto computers. Right? Why would people be more engaged by watching a lecture online than watching it in real life or watching TV? What matters is to get the brain engaged. 
and you don't engage the brain when you just have a flow of information at, uh, at the person. Today I have a slightly different message here. And the message is on the screen there, is that we should not abandon the scientific approach when it comes to teaching. A lot of decisions in education are made based on completely anecdotal data. And in fact, it's not that different in my own department. We often talk about teaching. I'm in a physics department surrounded by physicists, and you would expect physicists to only take decisions based on evidence, but it's kind of surprising to see that even very distinguished physicists, Nobel laureates, completely abandon the scientific method when it comes to teaching. My students like it when I do this or that. Lots of decisions get taken based on simply anecdotal evidence. I want to quote here Lee Shulman, former president of the Carnegie Foundation. He once said, and I, I love rubbing this quote into the face of my uh, colleagues, he said, the plural of anecdote is not data. Well, you don't, you know, use anecdotes for evidence even if there are many. And I know that in a sense because I based my approach to teaching on my own experiences when I was an assistant professor. That picture is from when I was an assistant professor at Harvard. I basically started doing what my teachers had done to me. I naively thought that's how we learn. I naively thought that's how I learned. So I taught this way and for many years I thought I was a good teacher until I discovered that my students were not learning anything. So ever since then, I've basically used my classroom as a laboratory to obtain data. And I'm going to show you today three little projects that I've carried out in my classroom that show how we can use the classroom as a laboratory to obtain data to improve uh, teaching. And I want to urge all of you to do the same when you have access to a classroom. It's not that hard to come up with nifty little uh, ideas. I'll talk a little bit about, these are three separate parts. And, um, you know, feel free to interrupt me at any time and ask questions. We don't have to wait till uh, the end. I'll talk a little bit about gender issues. And especially gender issues pertaining to science education, in particular physics education. Incidentally, I'm a physicist, so I'm going to put this in the context of physics, and you'll hear a few physics examples. Do not worry if you cannot follow the physics, because the physics is irrelevant. The message transcends the field. So I'll talk a little bit about gender issues, then I'll talk about lecture demonstrations. In sciences, we love doing lecture demonstrations. And again, this is, I think, very relevant for online education, where a lot of people think seeing is believing. The same is true when doing demonstrations. As a physicist, and particularly as an experimentalist, I thought, what better way is there to teach students how nature works than by just showing how things work? false. People don't see what they should see, they see what they thought they should see. So I'll talk a little bit about that. And then lastly, I'll talk about confusion and the role of confusion in the cognitive process of learning. So let's start with gender issues. For many, many years, I have administered, and so have many other faculty across the world, a conceptual survey called the Force Concept Inventory. It's a 29-question survey that tests students' understanding of the concept of force, which is one of the first concepts to be covered in any uh, physics course. And it's actually that Force Concept Inventory that prompted me to completely revise my approach to teaching because I found out the first time I administered it that in spite of my high evaluations as a teacher and in spite of my students doing well on what I considered complicated exam problems, they failed to do well on this concept inventory, which I, I thought was actually pretty trivial. But that's not to the point. I want to highlight another issue with this force concept inventory. 
basically, the way it's administered typically is once at the beginning of the semester, before physics instruction, and once at the end of the semester, so pre-test, post-test, to see what the difference in score is and to measure how effective the teaching has been. Well, the post-test scores show a disturbing trend, namely that men outscore women by a significant amount, about 15%. These are data actually from the University of Minnesota, which is a large public institution in the, in the Midwest. If we compare for a couple of institutions the size of this gap, here about 12% at the University of Minnesota, in my own two classes that I've taught at Harvard, two different physics, introductory physics classes, is pretty similar. And Worcester Polytechnic Institute, which is a small liberal arts college, also has a uh, similar gap. So the question I'd like to ask is what causes this gap and can we do anything about it? First of all, is it cultural? If you take all of the data from the US and put them together, you get about a, a 11 to 12%, very statistically significant gap between male and female post-test scores. Now, I have the benefit of getting a sabbatical every couple of years. And uh, whenever I spend that in a foreign country, I try to push my host to administer the FCI in their institution. So a while back, I was in Belgium at a you know, pretty well-known engineering university. And I decided to see if I could convince my colleagues to, first of all, translate the FCI into Flemish which is not that hard. I was educated in Holland, so I'm fluent in Dutch, so I could at least check the, the quality of the translation, and then administer it. And two things were striking. First of all, I, having been educated in Europe, always thought that in Europe, things surely had to be better than in the United States. They weren't. But secondly, the gender gap was actually significantly larger than that in the US. A little bit later, this was still in the mid-90s, I was in Taiwan. The whole first generation of my graduate students ended up becoming professors at Taida, Taiwan Dashui, which is uh, National Taiwan University, their flagship university in Taipei. I spent half a year there and uh, tried to convince the people in the physics department at NTU to administer it there. They looked at the FCI, and they said, no way, we cannot administer that to our students. They thought it was so simple, so trivial, that they refused to, uh, to, uh, to even consider testing their students. I said, but look, we even do it at Harvard, and the students don't do that well. Well, their, their respect for me immediately plunged, and I was unable to convince them. But fortunately, near uh, Taiwan Dashui was another institution, National Taiwan Normal University, which focuses on training high school teachers. And there they were very interested in, in this test. We translated in Chinese. I had my graduate students translated back from Chinese into English to make sure that I could vet the uh, translation. And we administered it. And not only did the Asians do significantly better than both the Europeans and the Americans on this FCI. But on top of that, there was no statistically significant gender gap. Now, I was never able to really research what the cause was of this, but there was one variable that stood out. At this National Taiwan Normal University, about half the faculty was female. In Belgium, at that university, I'm not allowed to disclose which one it is. After the dean saw these results, he said, he called me to his office and said, uh, you know, I never want you to disclose these uh, results. So I won't tell you which university it is. But at that university, there were no female faculty at all in the sciences. It was a completely male-dominated uh, department. And in the US, the number of female faculty hovers around 25%, 20 to 25%. So maybe the environment has an influence on uh, the gender gap. What about if we go back to the US data, where I have many, many more data, tens of thousands of data points. What about the effect of pre-college education? You would expect if a student has had some high school physics, 
then that's going to affect their understanding of, um, of Newton's laws. In fact, I learned Newton's laws in high school. When I went to university to study physics, we didn't even discuss Newton's laws anymore. The concept of force you know, was assumed to be already understood. Well, there is some correlation between students who've had, you know, between the, the, the score on the FCI, on the vertical scale, and students who've had no high school physics whatsoever, students who've had a course in high school physics, and students who've had a college level advanced placement test, but it's not very strong, which is kind of surprising, right? You would expect there to be a much stronger correlation, especially students who've had an advanced placement. This is for the female students, here's for the male students, and you can see that this gender gap persists across the pre-college level of education. And it's actually even worse if you look at the numbers, because women are underrepresented at the higher levels. There's about the same number of students who've not had, this is in one particular year at, in my class at Harvard, who've not had high school physics, 15 and 18, about the same number uh, who've had one year of high school physics, but then the advanced placement course is taken by twice as many men as women. So what can we do? Is there something we can do to mitigate this? Well, there's plenty of literature that shows that women thrive in an environment that is more collaborative, not competitive, and also that focuses more on verbal and visual representations as opposed, as opposed to purely mathematical representations. And when I read about that, I thought, well, what I'm doing in the classroom actually mirrors that. Let me tell you what I did in my classroom after discovering that students didn't learn very much from my highly regarded lectures. What I did is basically abandon lecturing altogether. Instead of focusing on information transfer, which is kind of ridiculous in an information age, right? Ever since the biggest invention in information technology, people have been saying that we should no longer lecture. I'm not referring here to the invention of the computer or the internet. I'm referring to the invention of the printing press and the book. Back in the 18th century, I think it was Samuel Boswell who once wrote, why are we still lecturing? We now have books. Um, but for some reason, people kept focusing on information transfer. As I said before, education is more than just information transfer. So I like to see education as a two-step process. One, information transfer, you need that, otherwise nothing happens. Two, assimilation of that information or in Piaget's terms, accommodation of that information. It's what the learner does with that information in his or her brain that matters. You need to connect it to the knowledge that's already there. You need to connect it to the experiences. I've often asked myself, where did that happen for me? Did the aha moments, the insights, the connections, did that happen while I was sitting in a, in a lecture hall, not that different from this one here, listening to my instructors? I don't think so. I think most of that happened outside the classroom. So if you think about it completely pragmatically, education being a two-step process, one information transfer, two assimilation of that information, and you ask yourself, which is the hard part? I think we'd all agree it's step two. So it's kind of ironic that in most of education, we focus on the easy part, information transfer, leaving the hard part to the students on their own. That's true in the information age too. Most uses of information technology focus on information transfer, not on the hard part, the assimilation thereof. Anyway, when I realized that, I thought, you know, what I should really do in my classes is throw out the information transfer completely, ask students to watch a lecture online or ask students to read the book, and in class, I teach by questioning rather than by telling. I walk into the classroom, I put a question on the, on the screen. Students think, they commit to an answer. The whole clicker craze started basically in my classroom about 20 years ago. 
And then I tell them, now turn to a neighbor who has a different answer and try to convince your neighbor of your answer. Complete chaos. But in the process, students teach each other. And then I have them vote again. So there's both feedback, which as many educators know is crucially important in education, and active engagement. You can't sleep in my lectures because every few minutes your neighbor will start talking to you, right? And the method has shown to give much bigger gains in, uh, in learning. But I'm not going to focus here on this method. What I want to point out is that it's a collaborative approach to teaching, students helping each other. And it's one that very much focuses on the verbal and the visual rather than the mathematical. So I thought, could that method help mitigate the gender gap? because it increases both collaboration and interactivity. So I decided to take the many, many years of data, about you know, 10 years of data that I'd collected, both in the traditional lecture setting and in the interactive lecture setting, and to compare three different pedagogies. I labeled the traditional lecture approach, which I'd done for many years before switching, as T. Then the first thing I did was make my lectures interactive by using this approach to teaching that I just described and which I later in my book called peer instruction. I labeled that I. And then a few years later, I decided not only to have the interactivity in the classroom, but also enf enforce that, I don't like the term enforce, but also encourage that outside of the classroom. So in discussion sections, in homework, I encourage the students to work together, increasing the collaborative uh, the, the collaboration there as well. So let's look how these three different activities impact the gender gap. So let's first look at the pretest scores for women for these three different treatment groups, T, IE, interactive engagement, and IE plus, interactive engagement plus. And there's no difference for the pretest because you know they've not yet been exposed. This just shows that over the years, because we're talking about the tenth year span here, the type of students that get admitted to Harvard performs equally, um, which is you know quite reassuring. Otherwise, this this research would have been very difficult. I put a little triangle on the far right side of this diagram to show you the average pretest score for women. Here are the men, there's a little bit of fluctuation there. Uh, if we take the average of these three different groups, we get that red triangle, and the difference between the blue and the red triangle is the gender gap on the pretest. That's how the students get delivered to me uh, in my classroom. Now the question is, can we close that gap? Well, let's first compare how women do across the three different groups, so traditional interactive engagement, interactive engagement plus, and you see that women gain significantly more as the interactivity gets uh, increased. The men do too, but the women gain disproportionately more, and in the interactive engagement plus, the gender gap is no longer statistically significant. So that's good news. That means that we can eliminate this gap, which shouldn't be there in the first place, simply by increasing the interactivity in the classroom. If you're interested in, in more data, you can find that in the paper that we published about uh, six years ago in the American Journal of uh, Physics. Let me slice the data a little bit differently. Who are the low-gain students? I'm showing there a data point for one student who started out at a pretest of 70% and ended at a post-test of 90%. I put the pretest on a horizontal score and the gain, the difference between the post-test and the pretest, on the vertical score. You want your students to be as close as possible to that diagonal line, right? You start at 90, you gain 10. You start at 20, you can gain 80. That means you have a 100% post-test score. Here are, for a class I taught at Harvard, uh, all the female students, some of them on top of one another, so there are actually more women than there are data points here. And here are the men, and if you look at those who score below the mean, you see a gender imbalance. There are far more women than there are men. After, this is in a traditionally taught class.
After implementing interactive teaching, all of the data points move up, which is great. Everybody gains more. But if you now look below the mean, you see that there is actually gender balance. There's as many men as there are women. So I think the, the verdict is pretty clear. The interactive teaching actually helps overcome this, this uh, gender balance. So the points I want you to keep in mind for this first little part of my presentation here today is that in the sciences, this gender gap comes from both culture and background. We have to do something about it, no question. Uh, but even if there is such a gap, it can be eliminated by uh, introducing interactivity in uh, in the classroom. I'm actually happy to take any questions now or we can wait till the, uh, till the end. So, but feel free to raise your hand and, and shout out a question because we're switching now to something different, namely um, lecture demonstrations. And I chose that topic because I think it's particularly relevant for people who are doing you know, simulations, using technology, or, or, or putting lectures online in hopes of actually promoting some real learning. I'm an experimentalist, as I said a moment ago. I always loved to do demonstrations especially if they're kind of spectacular. So when I started teaching, I would have this rocket car, which was basically a fire extinguisher propelled car, where I would shoot through the lecture hall. I would hoist myself up to the ceiling of a lecture hall that was as, as big as this one, using a set of pulleys. I mean, all kinds of... If there was a cannon to be fired, it was, you know, that, those were the best demonstrations. The students would remember the, the, the demonstrations vividly. But then I read uh, a thesis that was published at the University of Washington in Seattle by a student who had gotten a PhD in physics education research. And as part of her research, she had interviewed students. And in one of these interviews, she discusses with a couple of students who've taken introductory physics, but not majored in physics, their recollection of demonstrations. There's one demonstration, if you've ever taken an interactive physics course, you may have seen it. It's called Shoot the Monkey, or sometimes it has a more politically correct title. But anyway, you, you aim a gun at a suspended monkey, and it's not a real gun, it's you know, a spring-loaded uh, uh, gun. And then the moment that the projectile emerges from the barrel, the monkey, stuffed monkey, not a real one, of course, is released and falls under the action of gravity, but miraculously, the, the, the projectile that is aimed exactly at the monkey still hits the monkey. The reason is that it too is subject to gravity, so they both fall. So no matter how hard this proje projectile goes, if it goes faster, it hits the monkey higher. If it goes more slowly, it hits it just before it hits the ground. Well, two months after seeing this demo, the student correctly remembered that the monkey was hit, but was convinced that the person who had done the demo had adjusted the aim of the, uh, of the barrel in order to you know, allow for this falling of the monkey, which is not what happened, because the point was just to show that you don't need to adjust the aim. So I thought, that's weird. You show something, and then several months later, even though they've seen it with their own eyes, they remember it incorrectly. So I thought, what is actually the purpose of demonstration? Is it, is it entertainment or are people actually learning from demonstrations? So I decided to do a study which we carried out over two years where we basically carried out first seven and later 13 demonstrations in four different modes. I had about 250 students in my class, so I split the class into four groups. And these four groups would get rotated each week through four different modes of presentation. The first mode is very simple. We would not show the demonstration at all. That was our control group. The second presentation mode we call observe. We ask the instructor to do the best possible job showing and explaining the demonstration but it was completely show and tell. Yes, the students were allowed to ask questions, but nothing else. In the third group, before showing the demonstration, 
we showed a graphical representation of the demonstration, described what was going to happen, and we asked the students to predict the outcome of the demonstration using clickers. So we had a number of different potential outcomes, and they basically had to click in their answers after thinking. We call this the predict mode. And then the last one is discuss. We would give the students a worksheet. The top of the worksheet would describe the demonstration. Then it would ask the students to predict the outcome, free response, not multiple choice. So they had to write down this and this is going to happen. Then we did the demonstration, and they had to record their observation, what they had seen. So we were actually able to check whether they had observed it correctly or not. And then they had to check a box. My prediction does or does not correspond to my observation. And then we gave them a few minutes to resolve any inconsistencies between prediction and observation with their neighbors in a discussion. Of course, there's a different investment in time here, right? No demonstration takes no time at all. Demonstration, the observe, takes whatever the demonstration takes. Predicts adds another two minutes to it. And discuss adds another eight minutes to it. So we would rotate the four quarters of the classroom through these different modes, right? So if you were in my classroom, one week you'd be in the no demo mode, another week you'd be in the discuss mode in a, in a totally random order. And we actually never even told the students about the study. They didn't know they were part of a, a study. We followed up with a uh, free response test at the end of the semester. We, did, we only took the demonstrations in the beginning of the semester so that we had at least a month for you know, the uh, memories to settle in. And we added also a number of exam questions where we take the demonstration but put the same physics idea in a totally different context. Now, I'm going to show you an example, and again, don't worry about the physics. The physics is irrelevant, although I'll, I'll explain it briefly, but, but you'll still get the idea without getting any of the physics. Here's the demonstration. Demonstration you, consists of two scales, one on the left, one on the right, and there's a plank that rests on both scales, and there's an object in the middle, so that each scale reads half the weight of the object. Right. Then the demonstration consists of moving that object to the side and noticing how the scale readings change. A lot of students, a lot of people, think that it doesn't matter where you put it because the plank evens out the load. This demonstration in a physics class is used in the context of teaching a concept called torque, which has to do with you know, forces making things rotate. And the point of this is, it makes a difference where the object is because you have to balance not only the forces but also the torques. But anyway, don't, you can forget all of that. Just remember what is shown graphically on the screen here. If you move it to the side, one scale goes up and the other one goes down. Okay, so that was the demonstration. Then two months later, on a web-based test, which was a free response test, we put this question. We changed it into a numerical question. So we said we had this drawing there, and we showed that the two scale readings were 10 and 10 when the block was in the middle. And the students had to say what the scale readings were when the block was on one end, which is what they had seen, should be 20 and 0. And then we extrapolated to something they had not seen in order to test their understanding, namely what would happen if the block were not all the way at the end, but halfway towards one end. Right? This is something they had not seen in class. Well, let's look what the result is. 24% of the students gave the correct answers and correctly in their explanation, which was free response, mentioned the concept of torque, which is exactly what we wanted. Another 38% also had the correct answers, but used proportional reasoning rather than mentioning torque. We'd rather have them you know, use the concept of torque than proportional reasoning, so we could debate about what is right and what is wrong here. If we're generous, we could say both, both groups are, are good. If we're very strict, we can say only the one on the left is right. 20% of the students said it doesn't matter. It's always 10 and 10. 
When I saw that, 20%, so that's you know, one in five students at Harvard University, okay? I thought those must be the students who did not see the demo. But, you know, we had tracked the IDs of students so we could exactly see in what group they were. We had taken attendance, right? So we knew exactly what it had been, you know, in the group that had no demo or had been absent, which means they're effectively in the no demo group or been in one of the others. No. They were students who had actually seen the demo. In fact, some students actually wrote down, and I'm quoting here, as shown in lecture, it doesn't make any difference where the block is placed. I got so excited. I, I went straight to a friend in the psychology department and I, and I said, I think we found something really, really exciting here, some really new exciting psychological effect. And he said, really? And he, I, said, yeah. I said, yes, and I told him about it. And he started smiling and he said, Eric, We've known all along about this. <laughs> he said, why do you like physics? I said, well, I like physics because I don't have to remember that much. He said, exactly. The brain stores models, not facts. So imagine you're a student who has the wrong model, that model, the model of it doesn't make any, any difference where you put the block. Now you come to class and the professor does or teaching assistant or whatever, does the demonstration, and you see, contrary to your belief, one scale go up and the other down. You have what Piaget calls a cognitive dissonance. You go, whoa, this is different from what I expected. Maybe you quickly scribble it down in your notes. But, and this is the key point, before you have time to think about it, the professor continues to lecture. You have no time to readjust your mental model. And what happens for many students, especially students who are, don't have the discipline after class to sit down and think, let me sort this out, what happens is that instead of adjusting the faulty model to the observation, which is what we want to happen, what happens is that the memory gets adjusted to the faulty model. And you know, Psychologists have known this a long time because advertising agencies, trial lawyers, I mean, they all make their living on, 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 uh, on this principle. Now, notice that if you're a student who will actually write down as shown in lecture, the demonstration is actually rubbed in the wrong model, right? Now you're using your adjusted memory as evidence that your faulty model is correct. Okay. 10% of students just used qualitative reasoning. They didn't give numbers, they said up and down. Um, and another 6% of the students, the forces don't balance, so if you add the two numbers, all of a sudden the block has become heavier or lighter. And 2% have other incorrect answers. If we look at how this correlates with the presentation modes, this is what we find. And I want to draw your attention in particular to the observe mode. Those are the lowest scoring, only 18% got it completely correct, meaning they, they had the right numbers and they mentioned torques. So is just presenting harmful? I'm, I'm gonna quickly whiz you through an exam question, and again, you know, ignore the physics here, just, it's just so you get the picture. And, and uh, here, this is exactly the same principle, but a very different context. I would like to argue that the real hallmark of learning is being able to take something you've learned in one context and applying it in another context. We do very little of that. As anybody who is teaching here knows, after exams there are all these students coming to you saying, Professor, we've never done a problem like that. I'm telling my students, well, if you had done this problem, it wouldn't be a problem anymore by definition, right? Anyway, here's uh, the same problem in a very different jacket. A plank suspended by two ropes, and the tension in one rope is given. In, in essence, the scales have been replaced by ropes. 
Well, you know automatically, or you should know automatically, that the tension in the other rope, because of symmetry, also has to be 150 Newton, and therefore the weight of the plank is 300 Newton. But now the question is, if you move that rope from point Q to point R, what are the tensions in the two rope? They should, of course, still, the sum should still be 300, but how the magnitudes depend on those torques, which you know, are not that easy to calculate. This is a little bit harder problem. 36% of the students gave the right numbers, 100 and 200, with the correct reasoning. Then uh, different amounts of students gave wrong answers based on incorrectly calculating the lever arms for the, for the torques. Interestingly enough, as I was scoring this, this was a free response exam, I saw lots of students who came up with very curious numbers. 112.5 and 187.5. I had no idea where these numbers came from. This shows that, you know, when, when you're a teacher, and if you know the right answer, it is almost impossible to wrap your head around the wrong thinking of a student which is why it's so hard to teach students who have the wrong model, because you don't understand how they're thinking. In fact, I remember sitting there scoring this exam, and each time I saw, in total, there were something like 16 students in my class, or, or 20 students, because I had 250 in total. And I kept seeing that same number. I said, where does it come from? Then I figured out 112.5 is 3 eighths. But where does the 3 eighths come from? And, you know, 5 eighths is, 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 is 187.5. And then, after probably scoring 180 exams, finally there was one student who actually explained where those numbers came from. Look, if you take the plank between the two points P and R and take the left half and you say the left half belongs to the left rope and then you take the right half and say right that belongs to the right rope and you also add the the point, the part RQ, you get those numbers. So they, they just, you know, imagine the plank being consisting of two parts. I, I would never, never have imagined this. And then, of course, there are here about, you know, two or three students who had 112.5, and that's because the part RQ does not need to be supported at all anymore. It sticks out. <laughs> Who would have thought, right? It shows how interesting it is. Something you know, normally when you when you when you grade an exam or when you look at incorrect work, you look for a mistake and you stop thinking. The point I want to make here is that often it's very interesting to reverse engineer the thinking of the students because it gives you a glimpse into their thinking. And unless you're aware of their thinking, you cannot address it. Anyway, over all the demos that we did, 13 demos, you see the following correlation. You see that as you invest more time, the number of correct remember, the, the first column is how well they remember it goes up. Oh, no, no, sorry, this is the exam problem. I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself here. So here's, here's for the exam problem. So you can see that as the the discussion increases from no demo to the bottom, the number of students who actually correctly explains it goes up dramatically. Now, the aggregate for seven demonstration shows the following, and I'm going to show it graphically rather than in a table. If we use the no demo group as a control group, you find that just observing, on the vertical, I have the, um, the improvement in the student's ability to correctly predict the outcome. Well, in that case, it's usually a memory rather than a prediction, right? And the observe is barely statistically significant. In other words, the observe group does barely better after one month than the group who's had no demo at all. There's an increase with prediction and discussion, which becomes even more dramatic when you ask for the students to explain the demonstration. Observe not statistically significant, predict a significant improvement, and discuss an even bigger improvement. So the lesson, the take-home lesson for me was here, if you do a demonstration, at a minimum you should ask the students to predict it before they do it. It takes just you know, a minute or two, and look at the enormous improvement over the observe. 
The same should be true for anything that is done online. If you have a simulation, have pause before you show it, have the students predict it before they actually see it. It makes the cognitive dissonance so much bigger that students are more likely to adjust their mental model to the observation rather than their memory to their faulty mental model. So points to keep in mind before I wrap up here. Where's my last part? Demonstrations without engagement are just not very helpful. I always thought seeing is believing. I think this is very clearly proven here that seeing is not believing. What you see depends on what is already present in your head. And the results can be dramatically improved simply by having students predict what they're going to see before they actually see it. So anybody doing you know, online visual simulations, online demonstrations, and so on, should think really hard about incorporating such a step in their uh, approach. Any question? Yes. Why don't we wait till somebody brings you a, micro, a microphone this way? People online can hear too. So when I was, um, when I was doing A-level physics, we had to show our working out on the paper. We had to write them by hand, our scripts. Um, and I don't know how, how you do them nowadays. Maybe they're online or on the computer or something. But is, I know that was, must have been really helpful to expose misconceptions. To, um, to teachers and, and to kind of inform them as to you know, why we got the answer wrong. And I know we, we just didn't get a mark for the question if we didn't show our working out. It was that, script, it was that strict. So is there some way that that could be, um, you know, what's your ideas about that? Maybe using technology to, to kind of reintroduce that into, into assessment. Well, I was educated just like you, writing things out. And in fact, I still teach that way. Students have to work things out on paper and I look at it, but frankly, I, I used to usually not pay attention to the mistakes. You, you, you end up spending disproportionately more attention to the students who get it right than those who do not get it right. You see a student make a mistake, you say wrong, and you stop reading the rest, you stop thinking about why the mistake was made. So it really takes some effort to analyze for misconceptions and wrong work. And, and I would argue 99.9% .9 of faculty do not do that. They should, but they don't do it. Now, online, the situation gets worse because most online systems only check for the answer, not for the steps that lead to the answer. I wish I had time to talk about assessment because I've asked myself lately a lot about what role does the assessment play? And I think that the type of assessment that we have, that we use mostly you know, summative assessment, high-stakes summative assessment, is often the silent killer of educational innovation. You, you, you push the button here, so I'm going to get sidetracked for a few minutes. What is a real problem? A real problem is knowing exactly where you want to get, but not knowing how to get there. Right? You have a product, you want to make it successful. We have a problem in education. We want, to make problem, we want to make education better. In both cases, you know exactly where you want to get, a successful product or improved education. The question is not the outcome, which is known. The question is, how do you get there? If you stop to think about it, every real problem fits that pattern. You know the outcome. You don't know how to get there. Instead, most assessment, certainly in the sciences, does not fit that pattern, it's the opposite. You apply a known procedure to get an unknown answer, and the answer is checked. I would argue that that's actually an inauthentic assessment, one that does not really teach an interesting skill, and one that actually, a type of problem solving that can be done by computers. And just as assembly, workers have been replaced by robots, so will any procedural problem solving be replaced by a computer. So I think any assessment that checks the answer and not the procedure is one that is inauthentic, and I would argue that presently, most online systems 
you know, mastering, uh, web CT, you name it, there are many different systems. They focus only on the answer and therefore, you know, they, they don't expose any misconceptions and they don't really put the emphasis where the emphasis belongs. That's very unfortunate. And I'm not sure there's an easy technological solution. An online question. Let me see if I can read that. Does this have implications for the Khan Academy type of presentation? Is that a question? Yes. So, you know, the Khan Academy, to me, I, and I know Sel Khan, I've, I've met him, and he's an incredibly charismatic person, there's no question about. But frankly, let's face it, it's old wine into new bottles. It's simply taking the lecture and putting it online. That's not the hard part of education. Well, I said before, education is a two-step process. One, information transfer. Two, assimilation of that information. That's the hard part. I've been focusing on that second part because I think that's where we need to put our, our emphasis. Just taking a lecture and putting it online, why would it become a better lecture than, than, uh, than, than a live lecture? Anyway. Any other question on uh, demonstrations and the ineffectiveness of demonstration? Could we have the microphone? Can I, can I ask oh, a question? Sorry. There's somebody in the back. Yeah, I, I had my hand up. Um, I, I saw Sal Khan's keynote at Blackboard 2012 this year in New Orleans, and he was very clear that his new wine in, or old wine in new bottles is intended to be used as part of a more interactive environment in a school. I mean, that's, that's my first point. The second point is that I think the fact that you're lecturing at us shows why the lecture is still a popular mode of information transmission because it's a way to introduce information to large numbers of people in a cost-effective way. You know, particularly when these ideas are new. And I wondered if you'd care to respond to that. Oh, absolutely. I'm not trying to teach you physics here. I'm not trying to, you know, teach you something that is conceptually very difficult. So I think that's not the same. Um, I think, and you know, there, there are plenty of examples online of, there was one that was actually posted by Michael Pershan uh, a few months ago, look for M. Pershan, P-E-R-S-H-A-N, and there's another one by, um, uh, what is his name again, Veritasium is his uh, Twitter handle, Derek Muller in Australia, critiques of the Khan Academy and also ways of improving on the Khan Academy. The problem is a lecture, including my own lecture here, or a lecture in the classroom, or a lecture online, is that it holds the mind captive. There is no time when you're in the audience to pause and think. There is no time to let the mind wander. And the mind likes wandering. You need <laughs> to have your mind wander in order to make the necessary connections. So I think the big problem is the continuous stream of information. And you saw the trace that I started my talk with, both in TV watching and in listening to a lecture. The trace goes flat because there's no time to think and reflect. That could be improved by breaking up things in questions, but in, in, sorry, sorry, we're breaking up presentations into small sections, which the Khan Academy is doing in a sense, but it could be improved even more by having speed bumps in between those sections where you actually engage the mind of the learner by asking for input and questions. Actually, Sal Khan is starting to implement that too. You had a question too. Um, just a quick observation. In the early 70s, uh, I was at Sussex University and with colleagues we started learning to use programming to teach a whole variety of things, linguistics, logic, mathematics and so on. And by setting ex uh, exercises where the students had to design things to do things, they got feedback all the time because their programs didn't work and they learned from that and they were asked to write about it and so on. And I think that that is a way of using technology to give very detailed, student-specific feedback, which is highly productive. Absolutely, I, I couldn't agree more about the importance of feedback. I think the, f the feedback is so crucially important. You know, where do you stand as a learner? Um, and that actually leads very naturally to the last part of my uh, of my talk, which deals with uh, with this 
topic of confusion. In general, you know, instructors are, are praised for clear lectures. In fact, on most teaching evaluation, it's a question, did Professor Mazur give clear lectures, right, on a, on a, on a Likert scale of one to uh, five? And confusion is generally seen as something extremely discouraging, right? Nothing is worse than having a confusing lecture. But on the other hand, to wonder is to begin to understand. We don't learn by just opening our skull, taking the information in, closing our skull, right? You, you learn by thinking, why is it that way? And reflecting on it. And then going, oh, yeah, now I know. That's the real learning process, not just listening, storing, and regurgitating later. Although I would argue that much of our assessment, just as lectures are regurgitations of information, so is a lot of our assessment regurgitating back of the same information. Now, one thing I noticed when I switched from lecturing to peer instruction was that there were no fewer questions, but more. All of a sudden, you know, there were lots of students who were asking after I had them think about a question and talk to each other, there were lots of questions saying, Professor, what about this? What about that? So, and another thing I noticed is the following. Before each lecture, I give students a reading assignment. They have to read a chapter in the book, and they have to communicate to me before class whether they found anything in the reading difficult or confusing. And the night before class, I press on a button on my website, and I get the pictures of the students with their names, and after it, it says what is difficult or confusing. You know, normally when you teach a large class, you see a lot of faces, but there are no names attached to the faces. And when you check work that people do, you see names, but there are no faces. This was a, an opportunity for me to connect names and work to individuals. But the interesting thing was to sort of correlate the students to their perceived confusion after reading the textbook. I would have some students who would say, nothing was difficult or confusing. And I'd look at the picture of the student and think, hmm, this is not one of the best students in the classroom. Let me look up his record. Sure enough, was a struggling student. And then there were other students who said, I'm confused about this, I'm confused about that, I'm confused about this, you know, this whole essays. This is one of the best students in the classroom. I thought, that's kind of strange. It looks as if there's an anti-correlation between the students' expressed confusion and their actual level of understanding. So, does confusion indicate a lack of understanding? Or maybe the converse, does lack of confusion indicate understanding? So I decided to actually, after using this approach to teaching, to go back and carefully analyze the feedback I received from students on uh, their reading assignments. Now, if you are interested in more detail on that, details of that technique, which is called just-in-time teaching, there's this book published by Pearson Prentice Hall in 1999 called Just-in-Time Teaching, Blending Active Learning with Web Technology. And the idea is you give students an assignment. Typically, it's a reading assignment, but it, but it could be a watching assignment, right? You could watch a lecture, too. And that is followed by two content-based questions which are difficult questions. They're not the type of questions where you can just look up the information. You have to take whatever you've seen or read and apply it in a new context. Most students cannot do that. But they're told you're going to be evaluated on effort, not on correctness. Right? You have to show me through the thought you put in the questions that you've done the reading or the watching. And then the third question is the feedback question. What did you find difficult or confusing? I'm going to show you one example out of a uh, fluid dynamics, a fluid statics uh, class. And again, you know, there's some physics, but don't worry about the physics. And the idea was to analyze the understanding expressed by the answers on the first two questions and correlate it to the confusion expressed on the feedback question. So let me give you an example, and I'm going to give you the context here, too. So here's the, the first question. Consider the capillary rise of a liquid in a glass tube. 
when you take a small capillary, you put it in, the water rises in it. How does the pressure at point P at the surface of the liquid compare to the pressure at point Q at equal height? Now, let me give you the answer, and I, I'm not here to teach you about uh, uh, fluid statics, but the pressure is the same, because if there was a pressure difference, then the, there would be a flow of water into or out of the tube, because at the same height in a liquid, the pressure is the same. By the way, this was a class taught to medical students. Capillaries are important, right? Blood vessels, understanding capillarity. The textbook that we used was one that actually applied physics to the context of medicine. And it made a, a very strong point of always having examples out of the medical world. Here's question number two. You have a tube with a valve in the middle, and you have two balloons, identical balloons, but blown up to different amounts. Balloon B is inflated more than balloon A. What happens when you open the valve? The intuitive answer would say the big balloon empties out in the smaller balloon. But as anybody who's ever blown up balloons known, right? I mean, for your kid's party or whatever, you take them out of the bag, you put them on your lips, you start blowing you must have noticed that the effort in the beginning is significantly larger than at the end, right? Those first few breaths that you have to get in the balloon, you have to work really hard. Once there's air in the balloon, all of a sudden it goes a lot easier. The reason is that the elastic membrane, when it's folded, can pull in much more easily than when it's blown up, right? So actually the pressure in the small balloon is much higher than that in the big balloon, and something absolutely surprising happens if you do this. We actually do the demonstration in class. If you open that valve, the little balloon empties out in the big balloon. And it turns out this is crucially important in medicine for the alveola in the lungs. The alveoli in the lens are not really little balloons, but you know, they're cavities that are similar to the cavity inside a balloon. The main reason that prematurely born babies before 20, 21 weeks of gestation cannot survive is because they lack a substance called a surfactant, which coats the inside of the alveoli of the lungs, which is there to even out the pressure. Because if you didn't even out the pressure, then little alveoli would collapse into bigger alveoli. Uh, before 21 weeks, you don't have that, so you, know, you take a baby, expose it to the, or a fetus, expose it to the air, all the little alveoli expand, uh, sorry, collapse into the bigger one, the bigger ones burst, and you know, with disastrous consequences. The book actually mentioned that, right? So I thought it'd be interesting to see if students could take it from the alveoli to balloons. And then the third question, please tell us briefly what points of the reading you found most difficult or confusing. If you did not find any part of it uh, difficult or confusing, please tell us what you found most interesting. That last part is crucial, right? If you don't add that, then students could get away by just writing, nothing is difficult, right? Now, then, uh, if nothing is difficult, they have to tell me what's most interesting. So let me give you an example of two students responses to these three questions. Here's the first one. Capillary action is due to the cohesion between water molecules and the adhesion of water to the surface of the glass tube. This is a, a, a sentence just pull out of the textbook and, you know, cu cut and paste more or less, right? It's true. I don't know how relevant it is to the answer, but it's true. Negative pressures can result from the cohesive forces of water. That is another sentence out of the book. It's also true. I can't follow the connection or the logic between the two, but that's okay. Then, at the same height, the pressure inside the tube is much less due to negative pressures. I can't follow the logic. I don't know, but it's wrong anyway, so wrong. Then, the second one. The air flows from high pressure to low pressure. That's right. The fully blown up balloon has higher pressure than the half blown up balloon. Sorry, that's wrong. So the air flows from the fully blown balloon to the half-filled balloon. So wrong, wrong. What about the last question about the feedback? Nothing was difficult or confusing. The sections on the surfactant in the lungs, question two, and the heart as a pump were interesting because they relate physics to biology. Okay, so now for a very different example. 
The water rises because of an interaction between the water and the walls of the tube. That's the same idea that the other student said, but now th this student is trying to, to put it into his or her own words rather than using the words from the book. The interaction creates an upward force which causes the water to rise. The force is due to the surface tension between the water and the walls of the tube. The pressure at the point inside the tube must be the same as the pressure at the point of equal height outside the tube, because if there was a pressure difference, then there would be a net flow of water into or out of the tube until the pressure difference is equalized. Fantastic. You know, the student's own words, well argued, correct. Question two, Laplace's law tells us that it requires a greater pressure difference to maintain a small sphere than a larger one. So the pressure in the small balloon must be greater and the air will flow from the small balloon into the large one. Correct. Now let's look at the last question. I found the explanation of Laplace's law to be inadequate. And while I can understand the conclusion drawn, I don't understand the reasoning which led to the conclusion. So I thought, you know, what we, I should really do is take the first two questions for all of the 250 students in the class, quote them on whether they're correct or incorrect, and then look in the third question for confusion expressed on the topic of question one or question two. Right? So this student would be correct, correct, confused about question two, but not confused about question one. And the previous one, would be not confused about anything, but incorrect and incorrect. So let me show you the data, which shows something really interesting. Of the students who said they were confused about capillarity, 44% got the right answer to the question about capillarity. Of the students who did not say they were confused about capillarity, only 25% got it correct. And the same is true for the other question, Laplace's law. So confused students are twice as likely correct. And the reason probably is that the students who say they're not confused have not even begun to understand. They've just read the book passively without engaging their brain. They are not even realized, <laughs> they're not even realizing that what's in the book is different from what they're thinking. The same danger that appears in a quote-unquote clear lecture. You walk out with a false sense of security, thinking you understand it, but in fact you haven't even begun to understand. I'm sure there are many academics like me here, and you go to colloquia or seminars once a week, right? Oh, from time to time you have these brilliant lectures. Right? And then an hour later you come across a colleague in the hallway, and the colleague asks you, did you go to, to the colloquium or lecture? Yeah, I, I went. I went. How was it? Oh, it was fantastic. What, uh, what, what was it about? Uh, and that's when you realize that you can actually reproduce the, the subject, right? I mean, that's the danger of a, a clear lecture. Incidentally, using a research-based text, which is a text that prevents the students from reading through fast, which anticipates their misconceptions and asks questions. Again, shedding light on how we, we may want to do online education by just not just delivering information, but delivering information and having students reflect while they're reading it. We actually are able to erase that difference between the confused and the not confused students. But here's the key point. There is more confusion among students who understand, especially when they're not pushed to think. So I think that we must recognize that confusion does not necessarily correlate with understanding. It's also not necessarily the result of poor teaching. You can have brilliantly clear lectures, no confusion at all, but there really is no understanding either because most people have not even begun to understand. Confusion is part of the learning process and should actually be elicited. Socrates already said 2,000 years ago, we should teach by questioning, not by telling. Why am I making this big point of confusion? Well, you can go over the past 2,000 years of history of educating people and you'll see plenty of complaints over the centuries of educators complaining that students are not learning 
And as I said, 2,000 years ago, Socrates already said we should teach by questioning, not by telling. How come that we're in the 21st century and we're still mostly teaching by telling? And even now, with the move to Coursera, Udacity, Khan Academy, and so on, the focus is on presentation, not on questioning. I think in part it is because once you start implementing questioning, you elicit this confusion. And confusion is generally seen as something negative. Of course, confusion in and of itself is not good enough. You need to resolve it eventually, right? But unless we start to realize that confusion is an essential part of the learning process, it is going to be very, very difficult to change um, the approach to teaching. So the point I want to make by these three little distinct parts is to show to you how classroom data is vital to actually improving education. And as I said at the beginning of my talk, I see my classroom as a laboratory. In, in my real laboratory, I collect data on the interaction of laser pulses with matter. In the classroom, I collect data on education in the hope of finding ways to improve uh, education. So I want to end by giving you a link to my website. The slides are not on there yet because my hotel internet connection was not very good, but I'll upload them very shortly. And uh, you can also find more information. There, no need to write it down. Just remember my last name, go to Google, and then hit this I'm feeling lucky button, and then you'll have a copy of this presentation. Thank you very much.